Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. I think it's 2 p.m. now, so um, I think we'll just uh, get right to it. Um, once again, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bruna Obuagu. I'm a partner with ALEX, and I want to welcome you all to, to um, today's episode of the MBSBL Business Law Weekly Series. Um, today, the MBSBL has put together a distinguished panel to discuss the topic arbitrability of employment-related disputes, prospects, predicaments, and policy considerations. Um, I understand that um, Dr. Adioye Adefulu, the chair of the MBS bill, is currently attending the MBA NEC meeting and may not be able to give his opening remarks uh, before we kick off. Um, so I'll just go ahead to briefly introduce our panelists. I say briefly because I, can, I can't read the full bios of our speakers without spending the one-hour time limit has been allocated to this webinar. So I'll just briefly introduce our speakers. Um, so first I'll start with Professor Ofonze Amuchazi. Prof, are you able to, are you there? Okay, okay, thank you, sir. So um, so we have Professor Ofonze Amuchazi, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. He's the founding partner of Amuchazi Ozioko and Co. He's an astute scholar and lecturer and is currently the Commissioner for Lands in Anambra State. Um, thank you for um, attending, Prof. Uh, we also have Mrs. Fola Shade Ali, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, who is the Principal Partner, Fola Shade Ali and Associates. Uh, she's a seasoned chartered arbitrator and uh, with over 35 years experience in commercial legal practice and international arbitration. Thank you, Mrs. Ali, Senior Advocate, for being here. We also have Mr. Oluyemi Adeosho, who is the head of human resources with Etana PLC. He's an accomplished and skilled human resources, uh, human resource executive and researcher with over 16 years um, of experience across different high profile industries. Thank you, Mr. Adeosho, for honoring our call. So we're all welcome, um, Leonard Silks and uh, Mr. Adeosho. Before we we get right into it. I just want to say that while we welcome audience participation, we may not be able to take comments from our esteemed attendees real time. So if you have any questions, comments, please leave them in the chat and we can take them as time permits. So I think we'll just get you know right into it. I mean, we don't have a lot of time, so we'll see what we can do. This is a very broad topic. We can only take a nibble at it within the one hour time frame and repeat it to us, but we'll just do our best. And I'm sure there'll be other opportunities to look into the issues arising from this topic you know, as time goes on. So I'll start with you, Mr. Adeosho, you are an arbitration user, you know, given your wealth of um, HR experience, I'm certain you've encountered numerous employment contracts. Um, we want to know what your position is on the use of arbitration for resolving employment disputes. From an HR perspective, is arbitration okay. preferred over litigation, do you routinely ask for the inclusion of arbitration clauses in all your contracts, or are there certain factors or criteria that determines, you know, how you go about that? Okay, um, thank you so much, sir. I would like to quickly say that um, there are different types of contracts, you know, and some of these contracts, for example, have input from the collective bargaining agreement with the union in some industry and in some sectors. I need just to establish that. So that if sometimes the nature of contract for certain categories of employees will not be a far departure from what has been agreed, the terms and conditions. So for example, if arbitration is not even in the collective agreement with the union, it may possibly not be in the contract of employees. Let me also quickly say this here that there are also different types of employee category. So there are organizations where they literally put arbitration in all contracts, but to a large extent, arbitration is put in contracts, say, like managers and above. They won't put it in, in junior staff and lower cadre employees because you would not, and you know, by the time you are getting to manager and above, typically, if there is a dispute, the financial involvement may be bigger and larger. You know, if an officer sues you or something, the amount most likely will be easy for the company 
to, to pay off. Then it's also a factor of how much of engagement and interaction those human resources have with their legal department. So if, for example, HR in crafting the first set of, um, what do you call it now, contracts for employees and are well guided by the legal, legal team, most likely chances are high that the provision will be included for arbitration. Where I work right now, there's no arbitration in, in, in this. However, for people who are like consultants to us, like freelance consultants, we have. I've also worked in an organization where to the most junior staff, the arbitration clause was carefully inserted. And not only are you going to be given a letter to sign, HR will discuss all the content of the letters with you, including that arbitration so that you can understand and appreciate what it means and how it, it, it will work. So generally speaking, some organizations do arbitration, some don't do. Again, some do arbitration for senior roles or specialized roles, technical roles or roles that have to do with maybe key subject matter knowledge and those, those kind of things. Okay, so that will be my opening shot. But as a professional, based on my experience, I like arbitration for a couple of reasons. One, it is generally fast. We do respect to, to the courts. You know, sometimes because of the volume of um, issues at their at desk, it may take time, but arbitration seems to have a faster turnaround time. And arbitration do typically have, so to speak, professionals who don't only understand arbitration, they also sometimes have deep understanding of the context, of maybe the industrial context, and they are able to read in between the lines and uh, provide um, support and counsel. That would be my opening shot. Thank you, sir. Okay, just, just a, a follow-up question. There was something you mentioned. You mentioned that in some organizations, those arbitration clauses are discussed with the employees, right? At the time, those employees are executing those contracts. Now, what, the reason why this is important is that in many cases where we've seen um, employees challenge the enforceability of arbitration clauses at the National Industrial Court. One of the things that has been said is that um, they did not have the opportunity to negotiate that arbitration clause effectively. They were played the weaker hand, right? So they got the contract and they just had to sign off because they were trying to get in. Um, so from, from your experience, is this common? Is this a common, I, of course, you haven't worked everywhere in Nigeria, but is this common practice? You know, just from your discussions with people in your network, in your HR network, and, and things like that, is this common? Is it common practice that employees are actually, you know, arbitration clauses are explained to the employees, and the implications are fully known to them? Well, it's not a common clause. Uh, um, situation that the arbitration clause are uh, explained to employees. Well, let me also say this, and because you know, arbitration is just one of the many important parameters or items in the contract. I can hazard a guess, like 70% of Nigerian employees, about 70%, in my opinion, focus on the numbers. They will say, what is the net? I know people, apart from looking at the salary implication and maybe the periodicity of the salary when it will drop, by the time any contract is more than two pages, maybe five pages, 10 pages, many employees don't read it. However, when you see employees who have been born in the past, or who have a close friend or relation that have experienced litigation or going to court to respect to employee dispute, they pay attention. Then let me also say this, um, except you are, so to speak, a senior person or someone that has extreme technical capacity, most organizations make contracts like a take it or leave it. And if they will negotiate, they will say, oh, instead of 500 Naira, okay, 700, 650. By the time you start going to things like, okay, insert arbitration in their head, they may say, ah, this one's wala is going to be too much, too, especially if there are options. But if you are senior, to if you have maybe special knowledge, maybe you have a good network, they know you can deliver numbers, then you will now, most contracts are, are generic, then they may now have something customized for you. So if you're a junior officer, and you ask for arbitration, and it is not in the organization's standard, they will most likely tell you that they won't do it. Take it or leave it. Of course, that is not best practice. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you. So on, on the back of all that you said, now let's even go to the actual resolution of these employment disputes when they arise, right? So are there times that you've tried to, or your organization, wherever it is that you've worked, you know, has tried to enforce arbitration clauses, and then you find that these employees go to the national industrial court to challenge the enforceability of those clauses, maybe on the basis that the claims are not arbitrable. Have you had that had that experience? Yes, yes, please. You know, and it ranges from the employees claiming that they were not really aware of the arbitration and that maybe the arbitration clause was inserted with a view to, to shortchange it. And depending on the maybe lawyers they are also speaking to, you know, most people, when there is a dispute, they get counsel from external parties, which could include lawyers. So they may be advised that, no, let's go to the regular court or let's go to, we'll be able to get a, a better bargain. So you have things, things like this. Again, if, for example, it depends on in, in some of these disputes between organization and employees. It depends on the person that thinks they will win or lose. For example, I've seen situation if the organization is sure, if, in quotes, sure that they will most likely lose, they are quick to embrace arbitration or even let's discuss out of arbitration and say to out of court. You understand what I mean? But if you think you have a, a strong case, so it, there are also, again, you know, we have many one man businesses and uh, owner managed business. We, we've seen many instances where intentionally they will not allow us to put arbitration in the clause. Why? They know that the court process generally linger and they will say, look, I will frustrate you in court, knowing that arbitration will be more straightforward and quickly um, resolutions can, 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 can be arrived. So I've seen situations that it was challenged in court and I've seen situations where both parties, the organization and the employee, submitted to arbitration and abide with the, the outcomes. And there was settlement, there was no need for additional escalations. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, a few issues have been thrown up in your comments, such as you know, the issues relating to speed. There's some peculiarities pertaining to arbitration and the National Industrial Court, which will come up later, later in the discussion. But that's actually something that has to be considered, whether indeed the question of speed, when you consider arbitration over litigation, would actually apply when it comes to employment disputes. We'll get we'll get to that point. So now that we've crossed this threshold, um, uh, Professor Muchazi, we've seen that you know employees actually challenge the enforceability of some of these um, um, arbitration clauses, right, in employment contracts. Now, in the course of those, in cases where this has been challenged, one point that has been made by me, which I alluded to earlier is that these disputes are actually non-arbitrable. You know, it's been argued that many of these claims touch on matters like unfair labor practices, discrimination, and harassment. And these are effectively public policy issues that cannot or should not be resolved in private proceedings, which is what arbitration contemplates. So I want to ask you, sir, um, Professor Muchazi, um, is, is it right to argue that first, these issues are public policy issues and that they should be resolved by open justice, litigation as it were, rather than private proceedings. Do you agree with, with that school of thought? Yeah, um, thank you very much, Marvin. Uh, uh, before I start that, let me just say that I think that is a very valid point. And what is that point? The point that perhaps uh, um, that contractual clauses will arise out of um, collective bargaining agreements. So when you are dealing with um, companies where, for example, in their contract arbitration clauses, of course, the, 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 the union and the employer will have come to an agreement and they will have arbitration clauses in their contracts. But yes, I agree. Um, I, I would have phrased it this way. The desirability of a of, uh, of labor of of arbitration clauses in employment contracts is it desirable and then forcible yes i would say it's desirable and i would say of course it's enforceable depending on the matter of the arbitration i agree there are public policy matters that ordinarily it is difficult to resolve via arbitration i mean sexual harassment cases for example i'm not sure it'd be easy to resolve that through arbitration 
um, of fair dismissal matters have to be difficult uh, because sometimes the parties involved will want a determination of their rights. But I do know that if I'm right, in the UK, for example, I do know that all matters have to pass through the ACAS, um, the Advisory Consultation and Arbitration Services. Um, and then when the parties are able to agree, if they can resolve it through ACAS, it then goes to the employment um, tribunal for resolution. So are there matters that should go to arbitration? Yes, there should be. But I do not think that all employment disputes are arbitrable. It depends on the kind of disputes that arise. For example, where the example, which is because a problem to, to arbitrate that. Well, where it's not it has to do with certain matters like transfer of a servant, secondment to another place, those are matters that I believe you can resolve through arbitration. So I think that will depend on the matters that uh, the parties want arbitrated. But in summary, I think that it's important, mind you, that the parties, both the employees through their unions, like Mr. Adesho pointed out, and the employers are in agreement that there will be an arbitration clause. Because the truth is that, in practice, like you have said, um, once the matters go to court, the employees com complain and say, oh, we had no idea of an arbitration clause in the contract. So I was happy with the example he gave where do they have to, you have to explain to the employees. But again, this will apply to what I call high net worth employees, not your normal rank and file employees who can't afford to pay for arbitration services. But we're dealing with um, the top level employees, as it were, those are in a position to pay for those services. So are there matters that should go to arbitration? Yes. Are there matters that public policy matters that should go to arbitration? Yes. Sexual harassment cases, unfair dismissal, level um, unfair dismissal matters. I think those ones we should allow the courts to determine those ones. Hmm. Okay, okay. I mean that, that that makes sense, bro. But so so here's the issue then. Most times, right, at least from my experience. Um, when you see people bring claims at the National Industrial Court, right? You have, you know, you have some of those claims which you, you've referred to that are clearly arbitrable matters. But the other question I wanted to then ask is, most of those claims also include, you know, um, relief for damages, relief for declaration, right? That maybe the company acted in an unfair manner or that, you know, the employee was you know, uh, was it called subject to harassment, or usually those claims are fused. So if we usually face scenarios where claims are fused with what you've described as arbitrable and non-arbitrable matters, you know, of what relevance is an arbitration clause then? Because how do we, you know, how do we divide? How do we pick and choose what falls, you know, under the court's jurisdiction or under arbitral, you know, panels and, and territory? How do we do that? Does it not then negate the concept of arbitration itself? For employment matters, uh, I wouldn't say. So. I wouldn't say so. I think a lot will depend on the part on how the parties get from what I call well, the employee. What he gets from his uh, from his uh, from his counsel, from his lawyer, because you know another problem with arbitration of labor disputes. I mean, I'm a supporter of it. However, that's the fundamental problem which I've asked myself repeatedly, and the question is, um. I mean, yesterday I had a discussion with someone yesterday on this matter, and we had like an hour of a uh, discussion. Uh, the question is, under what law or act would you arbitrate labor disputes? At the moment, the AMA deals with commercial disputes, and industrial uh, disputes are not commercial disputes. And so you, you can't do that under the AMA, so more often than not, my view, it will be purely ad hoc arbitrations. And for those ad hoc arbitrations, it then means, my view, that the, the, the parties would then have a detailed arbitration clause with all the necessary things, appointment of arbitrators, et cetera, et cetera, clearly provided, um, spelled out, and made part of the contracts. But I think that, um, yes, like if asked, there are the issues of unfair dismissal, sexual harassment cases. I do know that in practice, so those matters are sometimes resolved out of court, not necessarily through arbitration, but through some other means. So, 
Um, I, I think that eventually it's something, a matter that uh, eventually we will have a judicial pronouncement on. I'm aware there was a matter that went to the National Industrial Court. And if I recall, the, the, the judge said, well, since the parties have agreed to arbitrate, they should go back and sort themselves out. Because unless, unless they do that, I mean, the, the hands of the court is, uh, is tied and we can't get into the matter. It's after the parties have had their disputes and then a decision is made and what is made, and maybe a party wants to set aside. Maybe when you can raise, that's where you can raise the issue of arbitrability or not. But my take is, yes, it's a thin line, it's difficult when the matters are interwoven to really separate which ones are arbitrable and which ones are not arbitrable. But if you do have a clause, then you, you try your luck and see how it works out. Understood. But, but let me ask, you know, one point is whether the, the freedom of contract principle, is it relevant at all? I mean, if at the point of entering into this employment contract, the parties agreed, whatever issues arise, whatever problems in that arise from this employment relationship, these problems, what those issues, those questions, should be determined by an arbitrator. Should the court then be rewriting the agreement of the parties? I mean, it's they, they agreed to it even before entering into that relationship. So even if yep. some of the issues that then subsequently you know, transpire might be viewed as non-arbitrable, if the parties have agreed from the onset, then why are we rewriting the agreement? But you remember that there are grants from which you can set aside an actual award. One of those grounds for international arbitration awards is when it's against public policy for the country where the award is made. So I think the same thing will apply in this case. The parties may agree, yes, we agree. We want to go to arbitration. But eventually, the court says, no, this is this is contrary to public policy. This is a public policy matter. I don't think we should leave this to private hands. We need to make a pronouncement. And the court says that you know, we have a, we have an option. I agree. Party autonomy, the freedom to choose, freedom to contract, decide what you want. But sometimes in doing that, parties also do not know when they've crossed the Rubicon. Mrs. Ali, I, I noted you were, you were nodding vigorously. Do you have any, any thoughts on this particular point? Uh, uh, in, interesting well, point. <clears throat> um, good afternoon, first of all. Um, and thank you um, to NBSBL for inviting me. Um, it's a very topical question really. I was just listening to Prof. Um, Leonard Silk um, and um, I think he's raised some points for me. Um, and the first point he's raised, which I think is extremely important, is this issue of if, um, in his view, he's saying that because um, the parties have agreed, there's party autonomy obviously in arbitration, and we all know that it's the parties that decide. However, the, the mute point here is if the parties eventually are not pleased with that uh, award, where do they go to? Um, in, in my view, um, NIC, the National Industrial Court, is, uh, I mean, was established for a purpose. And the main reason why it was established is for labor and employment related matters. I mean, the, sec the Constitution is clear, and um, Section 254 of the Constitution clearly states, you know, why it was. Um, established and we must we actually have to look at the at the um the rationale behind it's being formed it's to do with um prof has said it even um Mr. idea also mentioned what it you know when it has to do with employees i do not think i mean for me commercial arbitration is commercial arbitration the section clearly defines what commercial is the case law shows clearly what commercial arbitration is in my view Labor and labor-related issues does not fall under commercial arbitration. So when we're talking about the arbitration that has been established or the ADL center that was set up by the NIC, it's for trade disputes. And you know the rules as it's switch generis, it's on a class of its own. You can't be comparing apple and, and orange. They're two different. Um, and for me, they're clearly two different types of arbitration. The arbitration that we all know and we talk about is the one that um, is on, that's governed by the Arbitration and Conciliation Act that's now been repealed 
and we now have the Arbitration and Mediation Act. Even if we're talking about ACA or the AMA, the definition of commercial is still the same. The only difference is that one says it means, the other one says it includes. But it's still the same. I, I, I mean, if we look at what commercial arbitration means, it does not, it, it specifically excludes trade and trade um, and labor related issues. So um, when we're talking here about mediation or conciliation, it's the court under NIC that will actually have the parties and they're the ones that actually refer the parties that have come to them to go for mediation or conciliation. Um, and so, so I, I think that's where I, I would come in from for now. I mean, until you ask me, I mean, I'm just reacting to what Prof has said. And I mm -hmm. just think that it's really a mute point, but it's actually, there's a thin line in my view between um, um, party autonomy and the constitution. The constitution is clear. If parties now have decided and opted and opt for another process to review or to, or to, to resolve their disputes, the courts will not interfere. Parties can agree to resolve their disputes through arbitration. However, if they have a problem, eventually, um, the grounds for appeal or for setting aside under the ACA is different from what we're talking about under the NIC. They're just two different types of regime. Un un understood, Mr. Ali. So, so if parties want an arbitrator to resolve their disputes, we've already discuss the issues surrounding the ACA and the, the repealed ACA and the AMA. Yes, the term commercial was used. And in fact, the NIC had, the presence of the NIC had in a decision in 2018, made that distinction that the ACA only applies to commercial disputes. But let's, let's take a scenario. Parties want an arbitrator to resolve their disputes. How do we draft the arbitration clause? to enable us to achieve that objective. Because now, I mean, lawyers just put in ACA, AMA, in the, uh, and the associated arbitration rules in the arbitration clause and move on. Is there a way we can, you know, give life to the intention of the parties to have a private person resolve their disputes on that, you know, any forum, you know, if, if parties want to do that? Um. Draft, drafting of um, dispute resolution clauses for me, I mean, I've had a, a scenario recently and it was a contract of employment that we actually drafted for um, uh, um, someone that we know, um, sorry, a client of mine. And now um, in, in it, what he provided for, because I actually advise that in my view, when it has to do with disputes, actually relating to contracts, it's better to go to court. Now there's that point about the fact that NIC there's delay, inordinate delay at times. I mean, I've I've had experience where it's taking over five years to just get a judgment on, uh, for me, unfair dismissal. But the problem is when you now put, for instance, we had a mediation clause. So now parties within a year of them entering into this um, contract that they both were happy about are now actually trying to mediate. And I told them that mediation is only if both of you agree. If you don't settle, what do you do next? But when you have this mediation clause where there are no layers, I mean, you can have the multi-tier layers where you say that you know, in the event that you do not, and that's what I always advise, in the event that you do not resolve by mediation, you put a time frame of, let's say, 30 days, you opt for, either you go, to, I personally would just say that go to court, because I, as an arbitrator, will not get involved in a labor-related um, dispute. Um, my jurisdiction is commercial, and I'm a commercial arbitrator. I, I just think that um, we need to look at what the law says and read what commercial means. My interpretation of commercial is that it does not cover um, labor-related matters. So you go to court. Uh, and if, if, we, if I want to even go ahead and even explain further, you know, the definition of court is also clear. It says high court or federal high court in the is in the arbitration and conciliation act, and also in the mediation and arbitration and mediation is the same. NIC is was not mentioned. So when you're talking about who is court and who are the courts we're referring to, 
when there's a, a dispute under the arbitration and um, um, if there's even an issue of setting aside. But the grounds are very limited now um, in the new AME. But what, who, are, who do we refer to as the court? The court is the High Court of the State, the High Court of the Federal Capital Territory. It doesn't mention National Industrial Court. It also goes on to say who the judge, the judge is the judge of a, of a High Court of the State of the Federal High Court or um, Federal Capital Territory. So for me, it's clear that when we're talking about, co about commercial disputes, we're talking about this relating to contractual, you know, I mean, even when you talk about trade transactions, it's for the supply or exchange of goods or services. And then it goes on and it names all these, you know, consulting, engineering, licensing. It could have mentioned um, employment related issues and it was deliberate we do not because it's commercial and it's not about Nigeria, all over the world. Prof just said it, there's acres. So every organization knows what commercial is. So we should focus on how, what does the, what, um, NIC, the National Industrial Court, what has it provided for? And there are ways in which you resolve disputes under the, the NIC and the Trade Dispute Act. It has an, a, a, a court assigned AGL center. You can not walk into it. It's the court that actually transfers the cases. So if there's a if they want you to go for mediation and conciliation, it's the court that refers you're the president of the court. So you know it's clear exactly what, what the, the arbitration we're referring to under the auspices of the NIC. And when you're talking about industrial arbitration panel, also it's under the Trade Dispute Act, and also it's clear how it, it should be done. And the the, the, the appeal that goes from it goes to the NIC, and then from there, the Court of Appeal. Court of Appeal is the final court. So you know what I'm trying to explain is that the, the, the arbitration that we're referring to under the National Industrial Court is not the same arbitration that we know and we practice. That is ad hoc or international, as, as, as we, um, we, 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 um, we um, Prof said earlier. Thank you, Mandy. The, you know, the problem is that you know, even on this point, the NIC is not is not even helping. Um, I, I don't know if any of the speakers want to speak to this point because in 2022, what mm -hmm. Mrs. Um, Ali and you know um, Professor Amuchazi has stated is clearly in line with the decision of the NIC given in Ravelli and yes. Steel Integrated Services. It was a 2018 decision that was yeah, delivered. Ravelli. Yes, that was delivered by the president of the of the National Industrial Force. The problem is that in 2022. Mm -hmm. The Calabar Division of the NICN, the Chukwudi Ebe and CWG, had an application for stay of proceedings. That application for stay of proceedings was brought post one to Section 5 of the ACA, <laughs> as it then was, right? The claims that were brought in that matter bordered on, you know, relief for repayment of illegally deducted salaries and benefits general damages for inhumane treatment and punitive damages. An application for stay of proceedings was brought, was filed. The NIC had it and granted it. It was brought pursuant to Section 5 of the ACA because the arbitration clause in the contract referred to the ACA. So the application for stay was brought pursuant to Section 5 and the NIC had and granted it. Now, if we're going to, of course, many people will quarrel with the idea of later decisions being the extant authority on the issue. But if we're going to go on that principle, one would assume that the position of the NIC, and I stand to be corrected, if there has been a later decision after the 2022 decision on this point, stand to be corrected. But if we're going to go on the basis of that 2022 decision, the question then is, you know, has the NIC even accepted, you know, on its own that it's possible that some of these matters can still go to arbitration, you know. That's it, but I don't know, Prof, would you want to give your thoughts on this? Uh, if I were the judge, I wouldn't have presented such an application because like Fala Shadi says, and like we all know, whether it's Aka or Ama, um, these purely commercial disputes. And in the nature of the claims you just mentioned, I mean, I, 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 I said, there are matters that, won't really lend themselves to arbitration. They may lend themselves more to mediation. She made the point that what you have is co-connected ADR and National Industrial Courts. 
the court or the president could refer you to this ADR center. Of course, we all mediate every day in our lives. I know the thing about mediation, the give and take. So it's not like you have a binding decision as it were, compared to arbitration where you have a binding decision as it were. So um, I don't know, but I, I'm sure that matter will be on appeal, most certainly. And um, maybe we'll want to see what the appeal court will say on that. But um, I, I think that I want to align myself with what she said, that a commercial dispute is a commercial dispute. At the moment, we don't have a framework, legal framework for arbitrating uh, employment or labor disputes. Ad hoc, if we wish to, but a lot will depend on what we are interested in. And clearly, if I were involved in a sexual harassment case, I wouldn't know how that would be arbitrated. Um, because that is, like I said, it's a, it's a public policy matter. And I'm sure that whatever decision you come up with, once a party applies to set aside on grounds of um, it being called public policy, that will immediately scale through immediately. So I, I get your point. There is that confusion is still there. But I recall the even the president of the industrial court are taking the view that you can't arbitrate, uh, of course, it's just one person, but you can't arbitrate uh, labor disputes. I think the, the constitution clearly spells out the, the jurisdiction of the national industrial courts. And you know, that's why the court was set up as a specialized court. Um, and the idea behind that, of course, until the case of Skybank and Wu, they recall that before that there were no appeals from the national industrial courts, there were appeal. The idea was to see that soft matters were resolved as quickly as possible. Um, but of course, we have Asia challenges with litigation practice in Nigeria. So I think that for me, it, it's a very thin line. She, she made that point. And to be on the safe side, there are matters I would rather, I would rather go to the National Industrial Courts to resolve those matters than spend time in arbitration. And then afterwards, someone goes to court to set aside and then everything will have been in vain. And I'll have to go back again to start afresh. Um, um, okay. I also on, think on. that, um, I mean, I totally um, agree with Prof. But also, I think there's a point that needs to be made about the Trade Dispute Act itself in Section 12. It specifically says that the Arbitration and Conciliation Act shall not apply to proceedings that are held, you know, by that tribunal. So it's, uh, for me, I, I, if you really look at this, it's clear that the Trade Disputes Act, the NIC, they're in the world of their own. It's just like when you're comparing with the election petition. In Swiss generis, they have their rules, which they abide by. And if you fall, fall foul of it, you know, you won't get anywhere. And I think we need to understand that the arbitration probably is loose, used loosely, because if you look at even the constitution of the IAP, the Industrial Arbitration Panel, and how are they formed, and the rules that govern it, and the fact that it is not final and binding. For me, I think that is key, because the same law provides immediately that there can be an appeal. So the fact that there's an appeal shows from it get that there was never a plan for it to be final and binding. But we're talking about you know, protecting the rights of citizens, which is not a commercial um, display. As I think the, the use of the word arbitration probably needs to be looked at. The draftsman needs to look at what really they're saying. Actually, if the AGL center that they have actually formed doesn't even do arbitration. So I think if you look at all this, then we'll realize that we, we parties need to, to I mean, actually in-house counsels and lawyers need to be careful when they're drafting the arbitration clauses and, and think about what they draft. Because at the end of the day, you end up wasting time going through a process that you cannot conclude. Thank you. I've, I've been looking at your face, uh, Mr. Adeosh. I've been trying to see, you know, you started off by saying you like arbitration, you know, given all that has been said by Professor Muchazi and Mrs. Ali, I'm beginning to wonder whether, whether you've had a change of, a change of heart. So, again, I, I speak as an unleaded colleague. I, I will still say I still like arbitration. However, based on the exposure, that uh, the two learned silk has provided, the insights they've provided, it's clear to me now that maybe arbitration clauses should be more specific 
in terms of what it will cover. Mm -hmm. You know, so that that way, it's the arbitration clause does not intend to cover all, all the scope of possible. So we may say if you have this putting one, two, three, because exactly. as long as not um, criminal or something in the public policy space. And then maybe the arbitration to, to we should not also make it look like we must necessarily go to arbitration first. So I think part of the arbitration clause, if possible, could say the employee or the employer could opt to avoid arbitration from the onset. That way, if both of us agree, when I say both of us, the organization and the employee to go to arbitration, once one party decides, then we, we, we go to the court. So the implementation, I agree that that should be a, a review. Thank you. Thank you. You know, you know, one of the things you mentioned, right, was that one of the reasons why you like arbitration is the question of speed. But there are a few things that came out from uh, Professor Mucha's statements, I think Mrs. Ali too, in relation to speed, because even if, if we're trying to assess whether arbitration is even a, a, a good option, right? In in normal, in commercial arbitration, you know, if an award is given, there are only very limited grounds on which you can set aside. The problem is that for the labor, for labor matters, right? Section 254C of the 99 question as amended, if you read that entire section, it gives the National Industrial Court the power to sit on appeal over arbitration awards. So the question then is, if you have, if you've gone through an arbitration process under whatever rules, and then you come out from that, and you then go through an entire appellate procedure under the NIC, and then of course onwards from there. Um, Mrs. Ali, you know, does that even make arbitration a, a viable option for labor Totally matters? viable. I think I need to just sort of clarify. The mm -hmm. right of appeal, is relating to the AIP, is relating to just the appeals from the industrial arbitration panel, and not just any appeal. So you can come do an ad hoc arbitration, and then that's not under NIC control, and then you want to appeal, no. The, the section 254C is extremely clear as to the type of appeal and the enforcement. They're all relating to the award that's issued by the industrial arbitration panel. Arbitration any day is the best way. Is the is the for me is the is the viable way to resolve commercial disputes, and it, I still would sell it to anyone. I would still encourage business minded people to to continue to use arbitration. First of all, it's fast, it's flexible. You have you have the power to appoint you know your your arbitrator, so you can decide and specify. The qualifications you would want for that sort of arbitration arbitrator. So depending on the type of the industry. So if you're, for instance, is a banking, you might prefer that it's somebody that has 20 years experience relating to that dispute. If it's all related, so arbitration from is still a viable and one of the. I mean, now um, it's it's one of the best ways of resolving this because it's fast, and for commercial-minded people, they just want to resolve their disputes and move on and they can continue with that same business. So I think also what I would like to add is mediation is a viable way, is an ADL, is an also alternative way of resolving dispute. Mediation and now our act, Arbitration and Mediation Act, actually is encouraging a lot of mediation. I've been able to resolve a lot of disputes through mediation. And you know, even if you look at the courts these days, most of the time they would send you first of all to multi-door courts. And I think maybe what most in-house should do is to try and explore mediation first. And it's only when it fails, because you see your mediator is experienced and facilitates the discussion between you and makes parties see reason why they should resolve. It's not a win-win, but most of the time it does work. And, it, and, and the court statistics have shown that mediation is really, really honestly taking foothold. So I think that's what I would suggest uh, before we now start exploring, you know, going to court or, or appointing an arbitrator. Mediation should be the first um, um, type of dispute resolution process that maybe organizations should explore when there's a dispute. Understood. If there, there's so many important um, comments in, in the Q&A box that we would get to. Um, but let's just take, uh, I know Mr. Kuti has been, has been 
itching to say something. Mr. Kuti. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Guna. And then let me say one very good afternoon once again to the panelists and then the participants who have joined us in this. No doubt and great insight shared so far, and I'm, I'm quite glad that uh, we're having a conversation. Um, what can I say? I, I think I would just want to uh, chip in one or two things in relation to a point that perhaps has been stressed here, uh, that maybe in what to tell. Sorry, can you hear me? You, you feel that yes, in that's maybe the industrial court was not set up to look into arbitration uh, that have gone to arbitration, except the uh, strictly defined by the Trade Dispute Act and uh, ending up at the IAP and ultimately the uh, power to look into appeals coming from that, that uh, 254C has now created. Um, I, I mean, the, the view that I take, slightly differing from that, is that um, uh, there is no in itself cannot be submitted to arbitration. Labor inclusive, and then when we say labor, we use it as a generic term because within that there are small time disputes in private employment that you wonder why you go to court in the first. And the industrial court came as a specialized court, but the experience is that it's almost becoming an all comers of relation to disputes in employment space that should not even be there. There are some employment that really be submitted to arbitration or, I mean, consider true mediation. But again, this is where the big problem is. The big coming from Veli's case that you mentioned earlier on, uh, Ugona, and then alluded to um, a subsequent decision that seems to have deferred from that, and that even though it's still within the same box, the problem that I see in all of this is what I would call perhaps an inelegant drafting or legislative oversight when the Arbitration and Mediation Act in it, uh, in forgetting to include courts to include the National Industrial Court. There's nothing that stops employment and disputes in private employment from being submitted to arbitration. Absolutely nothing. When you look at the trade dispute that you are talking about, um, disputes emanating, I mean, the ones being taken up on behalf of uh, the workers by union, not necessarily. The disputes that really arise from um, employment of, let's say, an employee and an employer, which nothing stops from into arbitration. And again, I think that was a settled intention when somewhere in between that 254, I can't remember the particular subsection, the industrial court is encouraged or is given the power to even set up uh, a center to take some matters regular cost list and then submit them to arbitration. So, I mean, that's what really tells us that I uh, was uh, contemplated or is contemplated that um, private disputes, how be it the employment can be submitted to arbitration. Again, what I think is the oversight here and which would inevitably still lead to uh, some state flux or uh, the court not being sure whether it can look into matters uh, within that space is the fact that the Arbitration and Mediation Act did not, again, when it was made, even though it came about three or four years after Ravelli, in which the industrial court went the extra mile to explain that the only reason the court wasn't prepared, and it's still not prepared to look into uh, employment, I mean, disputes coming in relation to uh, um, arbitration space is because the AC, I mean, the Arbitration and Conciliation Act specifically excluded the industrial courts. And again, that's understandable because the industrial court was not uh, had not been created as a specialized court, even though it had been created as a court within limited powers. It had not been created as a specialized court as at the time the AC was made. But a AMA has come, and I thought that AMA could have conveniently rectified that. Because let's face it, there are disputes that would eminently go through arbitration. I mean, within the employment space. That's just what I just thought to achieve. Thank you so much, Ugona, for this. Thank you, sir. While you're here, maybe I should read. Um, there's, there's a yes. comment I saw in the Q and A box from yes. uh, Okbeko. I think I should read that yes. comment because it ties in directly to um, a lot of things we've discussed. So, uh, Mr. Okbeko says, I think that the proper thing to do is to have yes. a specialist arbitration process under the powers of NIC with respect to labor-related disputes. 
The provisions of the TDA, the Trade Disputes Act, relates only to trade disputes as defined under the Act. Now, the more you know, important point for me, in truth, the employment contract is a specialist contract with commercial elements, human relations elements, and psychological elements. Therefore, it is somewhat arguable that it is a commercial contract. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Well, I don't, even, I don't even want to get into the argument. It's needless argument whether it is commercial or it is not commercial. The truth in itself is that uh, we need a commercial space. If we need to design or to extend direct meaning of we need a commercial space. You need human persons to discharge whatever it is that makes the commercial space to exist. If we take it from that perspective, though, those persons, in the event of issues or disputes arising in relation to their contract with those who have employed them. Why can't we submit it to arbitration? Mm -hmm. To my mind, it is basically for now, for now, what continues to be a clock in that way is courts. Courts, the fact that A B at this arbitration and mediation are again as excluded industrial courts. So we are probably still going to be faced with uh, those line of decisions of rap early and all of that. Thank you very much. I'm not Thank a part, I'm not a fair, yes. <laughs> so there's another comment here that I actually want to you know address to um Mrs. Ali. So I think it's a comment from Israel Usman. He says, in my view, any dispute is arbitrable, generally speaking. Commercial disputes are different from labor disputes in the same way that they are both different from, say, cross-border investment disputes. While AME covers commercial disputes and referencing new areas like social disputes, labor disputes, not limited to union-related disputes, are perfectly arbitrable, just not under the AME. Exactly. That's the point. We're not saying they're not arbitrable. I think the point is that we, the question is if it's arbitrable under the Trade Disputes Act or under the Arbitration and Conciliation Act. And I still maintain that they are arbitrable because that's even what it says. It actually provides the Trade Disputes Act and the NIC actually provides for the mechanism and the procedural rules that needs to be followed. And the arbitration panel is there, but it is not under ACA. It was not an oversight when the ACA did not include NIC as one of the courts. The courts were properly constituted by the by the by the Constitution 254C. And I think it's related it's to do with labor, as I said, and labor-related issues was added to it when it was amended in the third amendment. So I agree with um, um, my colleague that they are arbitrable under the Trade Disputes Act. Thank you. Thank you, Mother. There's a question for Professor Muchazi uh, from Jamia Kolade. So the question says, with the current wordings of the AME and the position of the NICM on arbitrability of employment disputes, do you think there's room for some reform to bring some clarity to the issue? If so, what reforms would you suggest? Wow. Um, you know, Fulabi made a point a few minutes ago. And um, Fulashade also tried to clarify it. Fulabi said, and there's no reason why you can't amend the AMA to include the National Industrial Court, as one of the courts mentioned. But like uh, Fulashade said, um, it still deals squarely with commercial disputes. I think that you know, I, I think that when they go, I remember I had this discussion with the then president of National Industrial Courts, uh, former president Justice Adejimo, as well as the current president. And I recall that when the ADR Center or the NIC was established, I said, why is arbitration not one of the doors? Why mediation? And, you know, subsequently, you know, many things went through my mind. And I think that is it possible to have some reform? Yes, it's possible, but I think that the, the, the matters that can go to arbitration are very few, very few. I think it would even be easier, for I made that point, to resolve a lot more matters through mediation than even through arbitration. Because 
of course, you know the essence of mediation. You just got, got to get the two parties to sit down and talk to one another. Your job is merely to facilitate and encourage them to come to that consensus arrangement. So you know, these matters which we complain about and we say, in our, in our view, we can't arbitrate, you can actually mediate. Once the two parties have confidence in the mediator, but because for arbitration, you've got to have a binding award. Of course, once you have a binding award, then I think about enforcing that award. That's where some of those objections will come in. So I think that Daniel, his questions, yes, um, maybe perhaps before, I can't think of anything offhand immediately. Or maybe it's something we need to think through. Indeed, as we are just discussing this, my mind just kept on working. And maybe I need to do a, a paper on, on what I call the desirability of arbitration clauses in employment contracts. I was just thinking about it and you know get some ideas and see what we can come up with the views will always differ we always have opposing views for at eastern ends but perhaps one day we we'll see what kind of reforms we can come up with and i think he said i know he said i know you must have level part two it's something maybe i'll i'll also reach out to him we can put our heads together and and think about that will be a paper watch reading um we don't have a lot of time left but there's just one the final comment i just want to quickly read from richmond um, it says, considering that the AMA would not apply to employment disputes, where such dispute is then conducted under other rules or ad hoc procedure, can such be recognized and enforced in court if the losing party fails to honor the arbitration award? I think it's addressed to you, Mrs. Ali. It's from Richmond. So I can't even see the question. So basically, um, what you're asking is that if, if, if you've gone through arbitration, and you have an award. Yes. Go through the enforcement procedure, um, which is the, um, um, it, it, an award is final and binding. It, once it has not been set aside, you just go through the enforcement procedure and have it enforced if it does not comply with the uh, with the um, order of the arbitral tribunal. So just, just go to court, register it, and go through the process. All right. Thank, thank you, madam. So, I mean, we our, our time's almost up. So I'll just give the speakers just one minute to, to just give their final remarks. And I'll, I'll start from the from the lawyers on the panel before we get to Mr. Deosho, who has been consuming, <laughs> who has been rethinking his employment contracts. So so let, let's start from you, Professor Amuchazi, just your, your final words. Okay, just say thank you. Interesting topic. I think yes, we need to explore a lot more about this. And like Fola Shelley just mentioned, um, I mentioned that earlier on, yes, you can go ahead, choose your rules. Once an award, you can go to court, register it, and then just follow the process through. But I think it's important that employers need to think this through before they include attrition clauses in the employment contracts. And it's also necessary to ensure that even employees are also, the, the, the principle of uh, um, consensual, um, um, uh, Agreement is it's it's necessary to ensure that the employer just didn't just impose a clause on the parties or the employee or the employee um accepted to also refer the dispute to arbitration. But we should also be wary of what I call public policy matters, which in my view cannot be arbitrated. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Mrs. Ali. Um, first of all, is to thank everyone for listening. It really has been an interesting topic. I, after going through this, I was just thinking that you know, you know, you think you know all, but um, definitely there's so much room for improvement. But what I would like to say is that commercial arbitration under the ACA is definitely based on the unsuitable model rules. It's not the same type of arbitration that we envisage as the employment arbitration under the Trade Disputes Act. That is Swiss generis, it's on a class of its own. And I think um, we, if we can compare it to election petition, as I said, um, it has its peculiar rules and modes for resolving disputes. Commercial arbitration, which, um, which I, I adore, will continue to be a viable way of resolving and settling commercial disputes. But I think that we, as, um, we need to be careful when we draft agreements so that whatever clauses we actually insert are such that you know, are practical. And I think the, the what we've learned from today is that one needs to really think through. And there's some, even if we say it's, it's arbitrable employment or labor related, there's some criminal issues, tax issues are not arbitrable. So we know one needs to be careful when you draft your agreement, especially when it has to do with employee or labor related issues. Collective bargaining and all that obviously will go to 
the Trade Disputes Act. Well, thank you all for listening, and, th and I'm very grateful to have been part of this discourse. Thank you, Mrs. Ali, SCN. Mr. Deosho, they've been speaking to you. Prof and uh, Mr. Ali, they've been speaking to you. I'm sure you've been taking these things to heart. What, what are your final words? <laughs> That are My final thoughts, a couple of things. First and foremost, I would like to use this opportunity to say again that our labor laws need to be resetted and updated. It may, based on this conversation, it may not be out of place in the revised labor law to even put some conditions and guidelines to what we should take to arbitration, what we should take to mediation. This can be so, a, a section that will even provide some guidance and enrich uh, the discourse. Also, I'd like to say this, that uh, for both organizations, especially since they are the stronger uh, party there, most of the issues that lead to either going to court, mediation, arbitration, is due to internal uh, procedural and distributive justice system in the organization. If organizations internally, you know, their HR department, their in-house counsel, they put up policies and processes and work with the management and the other actors to see it through. You will see that fairness and equity will be more often than not be in play. And there will be minimal reasons to go to court, go to uh, mediation. Again, as I round, round up, um, what does arbitration do? Or what does mediation do? Dialogue. If we dialogue, both as employer and employee, reasonably, will be able to, to make a bigger MBA. But let me just say this, in case there's someone here who is an employee, maybe just need a job, don't just say, oh, they've given you a bigger salary. Talk to the lawyer in your space. And don't be afraid to pay talking to a lawyer to review your contract. They may just show you one or two um, you know, potential bombshells, and, and you will save your career and future. Again, thank you so much for inviting me to this panel. Thank, thank you, Mr. Deo. Yeah, just to say we don't accept tokens. We don't accept tokens. We, we accept <laughs> but you, and we don't advertise also. <laughs> and and he, when you said there will be no more reason to go to court or arbitration, I was like, dispute, dispute lies will fight you. You don't want them to eat. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's that's on our side. So thank you very much, um, Professor Muchazi, SAN. Thank you, Mrs. Fola Shade, Ali, SAN. And thank you, Mr. Uluyemi Adeyoshu for being here today. We're really, really grateful. We thank the MBS Bill for putting this together. In particular, I want to thank the MBS Bill Employment People and Industrial Relations Committee for working hard to organize this, this session. Um, we also want to thank our esteemed audience for attending this session. Apologies if we weren't able to take all of the questions that we put forward. Um, time constraints, I'm sure you will understand. I'm sure there'll be you know, other opportunities to, this, this is a very broad topic. So it's not something that can be dealt with in a, in a one-hour session. So there will definitely be more opportunities to keep this conversation, conversation going. And Professor Muchas, please, when the paper you know, gets, gets written, please, we'll be happy to, to take a look at it and see your, your perspectives. So thank you, everyone. I, I hope we enjoy the rest of our day and um, look forward to, to a good weekend. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. thank you, Prof. Thank you, Mrs. Ali. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Deosho, thank you so much. How about this, Mr. Kuti? I didn't see your... I didn't see that your hand was up. No, 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 no. I mean, I was meant to do this uh, backstage, so I don't know. Don't tell me we're still in the room. Where we are. Out there. We are. Fantastic. Oh.